Welcome students to the next unit of the physical science uh, quarter. We're moving on to states of matter uh, to the states of matter unit. Um, after this, we only have one unit left with nuclear chemistry where we talk about um, more nuclear energy type stuff. Um, we talk about nuclear reactors and nuclear energy and that sort of thing. Uh, but right now we're talking about states of matter. Um, today we're just going to kind of do an intro video and then at the end you'll probably learn something that maybe you didn't already know. Um, but things we'll be talking about, differences between solids, liquids, and gases, um, what I mean by the heat of fusion, what I mean by the heat of vaporization, and lastly we're going to talk about heat curves and how we can read them to answer certain questions about our given liquid. Now, with this intro video, I do not have any assignments that go along with it other than one check. Um, make sure that you get your unit test done um, over the uh, chemical bonding unit. So make sure that you get that done. Again, if you guys have any questions, always, always feel free to reach out to me. Um, we are coming in quickly on about three weeks left in the uh, quarter. Um, probably going to spend about a week and a half on this, a week and a half on uh, nuclear chemistry, and then we are into summer. So without further ado, let's get started. All right, so quick warm up, get into the science gears. Um, before in other science classes, you hopefully have talked about what the difference is between a physical and a chemical change. Okay, so hopefully that triggers something in your mind. Hey, physical has to do with uh, not anything about the chemical makeup of an object changing, but just its physical uh, appearance. So for example, like tearing a piece of paper is a physical change. In fact, there's also some that are uh, semi-difficult. A lot of people, the example I like to use is ice melting. Technically, ice melting is a physical change because you're not changing the molecular makeup of that object. Okay, so even though ice is in a solid state and then in a liquid state, it's still water the whole time. It's still H2O. A chemical change would be something burning, okay, because there's going to be some kind of chemical reaction uh, that changes the molecules in that reaction. Uh, dissolving salt is also a chemical reaction because the uh, sodium chloride is no longer sodium chloride exactly anymore. Um, those sorts of things are what we mean by the difference between physical and chemical changes. All right, so the first thing we have to talk about is the kinetic theory. The kinetic theory is an explanation of how particles in matter behave. So as you hopefully already know, matter behaves differently inside solids, liquids, and gases, and that's what we're going to get into in this video. Okay, the three assumptions of the kinetic theory are as follows. So number one, all matter is composed of small particles, atoms, molecules, ions, etc. Okay, that's kind of what we've been building up to. Okay, we started out talking about the atom and the history of the atom. Uh, we talked about chemical bonding, how those atoms connect together um, to make these molecules and that sort of thing. Okay, number two, these particles are in constant random motion, okay? So those atoms are not just stationary, they're all moving around all the time in constant random motion. And lastly, these particles collide with not only each other, but also the walls that they are contained in. And what happens with these collisions determines what kind of molecule you have as well as it determines the temperature that your molecule is at. All right, so particles lose some energy during these collisions with other par particles, um, mostly meaning that they lose energy doesn't really make sense because the law of conservation of energy says that energy can't be destroyed or created. Um, so what actually happens is that that energy is just being converted to a different form of energy. If you remember back to when we did energy in the third quarter, okay, when we talked about energy, energy is going to, in a collision, be transferred into different forms. And that's what's happening here as well. 
the, but the amount of energy lost is very small and can be neglected in most cases. All right, so let's talk about thermal energy. Thermal energy is the total energy of a material's uh, particles, including the kinetic vibrations and movement within the within the actual particles and potential resulting from forces that act within or between particles. Okay, so this is really just talking about if we add up all the energy that our little tiny particles have, that is going to give us the thermal energy of that material. Okay, so the movement is the kinetic part and the potential um, is the resulting forces of acts between them colliding and that sort of thing. Okay, so average kinetic temperature or average kinetic energy is what we know as temperature. Okay, in science, temperature means the average kinetic energy of particles in the substance or how fast the particles are moving. So if you imagine if these particles are moving really, really fast, that means that their temperature is really, really high. Okay, so as you heat something up, it's little tiny particles that you can't even see start moving around and gaining more energy. And as these things increase and increase in kinetic energy, they increase in temperature as well. Okay, on average, molecules of frozen water at zero degrees Celsius move slower than molecules of water at 100 degrees Celsius, which should be kind of obvious because when water is frozen, it is a solid, and so those things are not going to move as far or as fast with each other than, say, something at boiling point, which is in a water vapor that's going to be moving around sporadically. Okay, it's important to note still that we haven't changed the actual molecules themselves, just how fast they are moving. So it's still H2O at its solid state, through its liquid state, and even into its gas state. It's still the same molecule. All right, water molecules at zero degrees Celsius have lower average kinetic energy than molecules at 100. I think I duplicated that. That is my bad. Uh, molecules have kinetic energy at all temperatures, no matter what, including absolute zero. So we can never actually get kinetic energy to be zero. So absolute zero is technically where it's so cold that the atoms technically stop moving. Okay, it's so cold that literally atoms cease to move, um, but they still vibrate back and forth, so they still have some kinetic energy. All right, so let's get into the solid state. The particles of a solid are closely packed together. Okay, hopefully you already knew that. Most solid materials have a specific type of geometric arrangement in which they form when they are cooled. Okay, so solids tend to be the coolest or the lowest temperature uh, state in which our atoms are in. All right, liquid state. What happens to a solid when thermal energy or heat is added to it? Hopefully what you're thinking is those things are going to tend to melt. Okay, so the particles on the surface of the solid start to vibrate faster. Okay, they start to move. Okay, they are really, really attracted to each other in their solid state. And we're trying to shake those attractions and break those attractions to become a liquid. And so these particles collide with and transfer energy to other particles inside. Um, soon the particles have enough kinetic energy to overcome the attractive forces of this solid um, to change its state. So the, the particles gain enough kinetic energy to slip out of their ordered arrangement and the solid begins to melt. Okay, so you'll notice again if you think about, I'm going to refer back to ice cubes because everybody pretty much knows what happens to water when it warms up. So ice cubes, they don't just automatically, boom, everything is melted. Okay, They slowly melt. So the things on the outside melt first, and then they begin moving around at a faster pace, and they break off some more pieces of that, <coughs> excuse me, of that ice cube, okay, giving it more and more energy as it goes. Okay, this is known as the melting point or the temperature at which a solid begins to liquefy. Okay, so we know that at zero degrees Celsius, that is the one for water. 
Okay, other solids obviously have different melting points. We talked about melting points again when we talked about um, the different bonds and what it takes to break those bonds, uh, that sort of thing. Okay, energy is required for the particles to slip out of this ordered arrangement. So if energy does not enter that solid, it's not ever going to melt. Okay, so thermal energy has to be introduced to this solid in order to vibrate these particles enough, okay, eventually to get to a point where they start melting. Hey, now, what I need you to make sure is that this is different than what I'm going to describe to you as the heat of fusion. So, melting point is a temperature. The amount of energy required to change a substance from the solid phase to the liquid phase at its melting point is known as the heat of fusion. So heat of fusion, excuse me, heat of fusion is the measure of energy required. Okay, energy. So heat of fusion is energy, melting point is temperature. Okay, so heat of fusion is basically saying we have gained enough energy to change this solid to a liquid. Okay, so heat of fusion is solid to liquid. Okay, particles in a liquid have more kinetic energy than the particles in a solid. So this heat of fusion is energy added to our system to change this solid into a liquid. All right, liquid flow. This extra kinetic energy allows particles to partially overcome the attractions to other particles. Remember, as a solid, okay, they are confined to a specific geometric shape because of their attractive forces between each other. Now that we're in a liquid, they tend to flow and they fill the container in which they are in. The particles can slide past each other, allowing liquids to flow and take the shape of their container. Hey, however, the particles in a liquid have not completely overcome the attractive forces between them. They are still connected. Hey, they are not completely free flowing yet. Hey, this causes the particles to cling together, giving liquids a definite volume. Okay, so what we're trying to say here is that they haven't completely stopped being attracted to each other, but they are not as attracted to each other as they were um, as solids. All right, so next we have the gas state. Gas particles have enough kinetic energy to overcome the attractions between them. So that means they are completely bouncing off the walls of their container at rapid speeds and there is basically almost no attraction between these molecules they're colliding and creating all this thermal energy gases do not have a fixed volume or shape hey the only thing that you can measure with volume is the volume of the container that the actual gas is in you're not sure if it is completely filled technically um, therefore, they can spread far apart or contract to fill the container that they are in. So, for example, if you have a cube of oxygen, okay, and you shrink your container, you don't have less oxygen now. It's still the same amount of oxygen. It fits whatever container you happen to have. Whereas, if you had water in a container and it was completely full, if I tried to shrink that, it's not going to work okay water is going to spill out okay that's not always the case with gases they tend to take the volume that they are in so let's talk about how we talked about how a solid becomes a liquid let's talk about how a liquid becomes a gas the particles in a liquid are constantly moving some particles are moving faster and have more kinetic energy than others. The particles that are moving fast enough can escape the attractive forces of other particles and enter the gas state. This happens through evaporation uh, for our water. Okay, you guys have talked about the water cycle, I'm sure, um, maybe back even in middle school. When you talk about water escaping from liquid state to gas state to become vapor. Okay, this process is called vaporization. Vaporization can occur in two ways, evaporation or forced boiling. Okay, evaporation is vaporization that occurs at the surface of a liquid and can occur at 
temperatures below the liquid's actual boiling point. So it doesn't technically take certain temperatures to make sure evaporation occurs. If you imagine uh, water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius, okay, but you can get water to evaporate on your porch when it's 70 degrees out. Okay, that's because of evaporation and not because of boiling. Okay, to evaporate particles must have enough kinetic energy to escape the attractive forces of the liquid. They must be at the liquid surface and traveling away from the liquid. So this all means that basically on the surface of your water, those molecules on the surface are gonna get enough energy to separate themselves from the other liquid in the form of a gaseous state. And this is why evaporation can still occur below the boiling point um, and still give us water vapor. Unlike evaporation, boiling occurs throughout a liquid at a specific temperature depending on the pressure on the surface of the liquid. Okay, so boiling water at 100 degrees Celsius, okay, uh, it occurs throughout the liquid. So it's not just the surface that's boiling, it is the entire liquid. And so we're adding this heat energy to the entire liquid. Okay, the boiling point of a liquid is the temperature at which the pressure of the vapor in the liquid is equal to the external pressure acting on the surface of the liquid. So basically we have the <coughs> external pressure acting on the surface. And if we heat up these molecules enough, okay, they're gonna burst through that pressure, which is what causes the air bubbles in water boiling uh, because it's overcoming the external pressure from outside. Okay, I don't know if you guys have ever noticed or have ever tried this, but it actually, takes more time to boil something at sea level than it does to boil at, uh, let's say, in the mountains at higher altitude. And that's because of the atmospheric pressure. Okay, the atmospheric pressure is less up here, more at sea level. Okay, and That's just one of the ways that the external pressure acting on the surface is different. So that's what determines when something boils. Okay, so just like I did last time, melting point is a temperature, boiling point is a temperature, heat of fusion is an energy, heat of vaporization is also an energy. <coughs> heat of vaporization is the amount of energy required for a liquid at its boiling point to become a gas. Okay, so again, we have to give enough energy to this liquid to break the bonds that it has as a liquid and to make these molecules bounce so freely that they become a gas. Okay, what happens to the attractive forces between the particles in a gas? Okay, the gas particles are moving so quickly and are so far apart that they overcome the attractive forces between them. Okay, they are moving around so sporadically that they essentially have no attractive forces between them. They are bouncing off the walls of their container and all around so quickly. Hey, this is called diffusion. This is how, because of how they're moving, uh, the spreading of particles throughout a given volume until they are uniformly distributed. So if you imagine as they start, okay, they may start boiling here. And so I have a big concentration here, but eventually they're gonna gain enough energy to fill an entire container um, completely uniformly across all the parts of the container. All right, so let's get into heating curves. This is the last topic that we need to talk about. Um, let me see if I can grab my cursor, if I can find it. Okay, so, so we have this cursor here. All right, this type of graph is called a heating curve because it shows the thermal chain or the temperature change of water as thermal energy or heat is added. Uh -huh. Okay, notice that the two areas on the graph where the temperature does not change. So we're talking about uh, B here, okay? B, our temperature is straight across, and D right there, okay? 
So those are very two, two very important parts of our heating curve. Um, we're going to talk about it here in a second, I believe, on my next slide. Let's go to that one. Okay, so make sure at zero degrees Celsius, ice is melting. So zero degrees Celsius down here during B, that is when ice is melting. Okay. Um, okay, so the temperature remains constant during melting. Okay, so while the object, in this case, we're going to make it an ice cube in water. Okay, while it's melting, the temperature is going to stay at zero. Okay, after the attractive forces are overcome, particles move more freely and their average kinetic energy or temperature increases. So it's very, very important to note okay, what each area is saying. So here, what I'm going to say is that at location A, that is when I am a solid. Okay, so if you look at A on my graph, okay, everything below zero degrees Celsius, my water is going to be a solid. Okay, so everything below zero is going to be a solid. Now, B is the weird area. Okay, B is when we are starting to melt. So we're not completely a solid and we're not completely a liquid yet. So during B, we are melting. And you guys can't see that because I'm writing in white. Melting. Okay. During C, okay, if you imagine, once we get to the end of B, which is my one, two, three, fourth tick mark, whether that's seconds or minutes or whatever it is, okay, right then, that is when all of the ice has melted and I am completely a liquid at that point. So for all of C, okay, for all of C, I am a liquid, okay? And so basically think about this as, putting liquid in your pot on the stove, okay? It doesn't automatically go to boiling. You have to increase the temperature, okay? You have to add heat to it in order to change it to boiling like you want it to be, okay? At D, just like B was melting, D is going to be where it's boiling, okay? And then finally E, is where it's going to be a gas, okay? And so everything above 100 degrees Celsius, I'm gonna have water vapor no matter what. Okay, hopefully that makes sense about what, how this heating curve works and how you can see the state changes uh, in your heat curve. Now, we're not always gonna use water. Sometimes we'll use different substances, so they'll still have the same general shape, but they can change depending on the substance that we're using. Okay, so at 100 degrees Celsius, water is boiling and vaporizing, and the temperature remains the same. Just like I said on the last slide, that was talking about D being the place where our water is boiling. Not all of the water has boiled into a gas yet. And then E is where they finally have enough energy that we have no more water or no more liquid water left, and we only have water vapor. Okay, now, some things that I didn't label last time that I do want to. Okay, these little, uh, I'm gonna circle them. This one right here and this one right here. Okay, those are two very important places. Okay, if you think about what's happening from B to C, okay, again, we're changing from a Remember, B was when we are melting, so that's when we have a little bit of the solid ice left and some liquid because we're not completely a liquid yet. Okay, once we change from a little bit of solid and a little bit of liquid to completely liquid, again, that is called the heat. I've got to hold my screen so it doesn't shake. Of fusion. Okay, this is where the heat of fusion occurred on our heat curve because our solid completely changed to a liquid by that time. Okay, this one is your heat 
of vaporization. Notice that I'm not talking about a Hey, I'm not talking about a temperature. I'm talking about a specific point in our heat curve because that's when our substance gained enough energy to change states. Okay, so it's very, very important that you guys are able to identify those. And notice that it's always from where it's flat to increasing. Okay, these two points, this and this, they don't mean anything to us. All that tells us is when we begin to melt or when we begin to boil. That's it. Okay, it's nothing special. It's nothing uh, heat effusion. I mean, technically, I guess you could call this your melting point. Okay, that's when it begins to melt. And this is your boiling point. Okay, so again, making sure we understand that those four things are all very, very different. All right, and this is the last piece of information I have for you. Just in case you are curious, hey, okay, on the next video, we're gonna start talking about things called enthalpy and entropy and Gibbs free energy. Um, just some other things that have to deal with energy and, um, and we'll get into that later. Uh, but if you were curious on what it's called to go from certain states to other states, I put this uh, nice graphic together because there is technically, in case you were wondering, a way to go straight from a solid to a gas. It takes a lot of energy, takes a lot of heat, okay? But that is called sublimation. Not that you'll actually need to know that or anything like that, but I just thought that it was interesting. Um, we also do next time talk about plasma a little bit. It's the fourth state of matter. We don't deal with it a whole lot in this class um, just because it's easier for us to go solid liquids and gases. Um, this is all I have for you today. Make sure that you finish your unit test. Other than that, make sure that you do the check for this video. And other than that, thanks for watching.